So, without further ado, what I'm going to do is uh, introduce the next session, and I think this is um, a very important um, session for us to actually listen to, and unfortunately the speaker, Dr. Evan Adams, had, was, wasn't able to be here, but this is all about First Nations Health Authority update. And I think many of you know that we are the only province in Canada to have a First Nations Health Authority, which is a, a quite impressive feat, and that First Nations are, make up one of our most disadvantaged populations, not only because they're rural and remote, but because of their history in residential schools and uh, their um, mistrust appropriately of much of what uh, we've done. Um, Evan Adams is a Coast Salish physician and actor actually from the Silliman Band and he grew up outside of Powell River. He's quite accomplished and actually f was one of the um, directors of the Indigenous Physicians Association of UB at UBC and the Indigenous Peoples Association uh, Council which is a, of Canada which is a, a large uh, group of um, physicians from uh, First Nations, Métis, and Inui. He actually is trained as a general practitioner and has a Master's of Health Administration from Johns Hopkins and also uh, trained both in Calgary and at UBC. He's a very accomplished um, physician, but also a very accomplished um, um, leader and is the first um, Chief Executive Officer and Chief Medical Officer of the First Nations Health Authority. And so we, and we've been working with him on a number of projects and uh, we thought that you should hear what he has to say about First Nations Health Authority. And so this is our first head style talk. Hi there, my name is Dr. Evan Adams and I'm the Chief Medical Officer of the First Nations Health Authority here in Vancouver, British Columbia. I'm really happy to talk to you today for several minutes about the idea of um, Aboriginal and First Nations health as it pertains to you know, the topic uh, kidney health. Um, and uh, I think today will be a, a little bit different than the other presenters. And so if you just uh, bear with me for the next uh, 20 minutes or so, um, to talk about um, some other kinds of um, concepts of, of health and wellness. So um, uh, I'm from Sliman First Nation, uh, which is near the town of Powell River, and I grew up with a very traditional uh, father and uh, a mother who went to residential school for, um, well, about, yeah, for, for 12 years, because she graduated from grade 12, and she spent the first uh, couple of years of that in a TB hospital. And uh, I, I'm telling you that because I think it's uh, really important. They're together because they came from um, different worlds. He was a traditional person who really knew his territory. Um, she could function well in a modern society. She could um, read and write. And um, my mother really didn't even know how to cook a fish when they, when they married, even though we're people of the salmon, uh, and, my, and my dad uh, well, English is a second language, and uh, he doesn't read or write very well at all. Um, and I think that, um, if you go to the next slide, um, that kind of two solitudes, the idea of um, indigenous peoples living within dominant cultures, is one that's actually um, very well noted by, say, the United Nations, which recognizes about 80 indigenous cultures around the world living in varying countries uh, from the United States, uh, Australia, in uh, Polynesia, parts of Asia, actually on every continent except Antarctica, there are indigenous peoples who've been impacted by waves of migration. And migration is not a bad word. We're human beings, we have legs, we're not barnacles. We move around and certainly every single person who's, um, who's out there has migrated to a place of other, to a place where there's a different culture um, than the one that they were born into, and that's a very natural process. But for indigenous peoples in Canada, and Canada has indigenous roots, there were millions of indigenous people here before um, the arrival of Christopher Columbus, um, and uh, those indigenous peoples used to own everything, and now they own hardly anything, and indigenous peoples in Canada have the worst health of any ethnic group in the country. Uh, and that is partly not by chance, it's partly by um, their uh, cultural and historical inheritance. So we'll talk about that. The, the picture on the slide is actually of an island in my territory. It's called uh, Ayus, uh, Savory Island in English. Um, the island, if you cut it along its long spine, uh, one half has been cut into little tiny pieces of real estate, postage sized, um, some of the most expensive in the country and thus in the world. 
And the other side, which is still in the possession of indigenous peoples, of, you know, of my peoples, of the Tla'amen, part of the Coast Salish-speaking tribes, is completely undeveloped. There isn't even a place to pitch a tent, or there isn't even a tap or an outhouse. And uh, those two solitudes um, exist side by side. And to me, they're very representative of Canada, of indigenous Canadians and other Canadians um, living in their two solitudes, when really, on this island, they could be living um, together and saying, you know, we share a water table, we share this beautiful ocean, we share this land, um, how do we get along? And if we had a hospital or a clinic, if we had a doctor or say a kidney doctor or a transplant service, which side of the island would that um, clinic or service be on? And who would go there? Certainly it is meant to be um, for all of us here who live on this island, but that maybe isn't necessarily quite the case. Uh, um, and certainly in a perfect world, um, those two sides of the island um, would coexist um, harmoniously uh, with respect and honor between them, not just merely tolerating each other, or even worse, fighting over resources. Let's go to the next slide. This is an elder um, from my community. Um, she was a very wonderful woman, but um, she reminded me of many things, or this photo reminds me of many things. I asked her when I was little, I said, you know, what was it like before residential school? She hadn't gone to residential school. What did you do before there was a school system? And she said, and, and I'm saying this word perfect, she said, there was nothing to do, we had nothing to do but help the people. Her education was about going out and doing whatever needed doing. She would go and draw water for a family. She would look after children, you know, who were smaller than her. Um, sometimes she would cook or she would clean or sh she would be cutting wood. And sometimes she had very complicated um, things to look after even though she was a little girl. Whatever needed doing. And I, and I remember that idea of service, whatever needed doing, um, as I trained as a doctor and um, other doctors or <laughs> other doctors, it was me. Uh, I remember describing to an elder one saying, Oh, can you imagine I was in a merge tonight and uh, I had a, you know, a stroke and a heart attack and I had a motor vehicle accident with three victims that were lying there and needed to be assessed. assessed and, uh, and then this little old lady says, can you get me a glass of water? Can you imagine I was so busy and important and she asked me to get her some water? And the elder said, oh, maybe she thought you were there to help. And uh, it really was uh, a reminder to me that um, we must do whatever, whatever needs doing. Uh, and so for physicians, if we're not serving one part of the population and we're overly serving another, um, we really should um, take feedback and say, I, I am meant to help everywhere, not just this group over that group. And actually the inequities in health that we can see, and we'll talk about inequities in kidney outcomes, they're actually immoral. Uh, we, we, we mustn't support a system that um, favors one type of patient um, and neglects another. Um, I remember speaking to uh, a minister of health once, and uh, he was saying, you know, are we in charge of this particular population that he didn't really quite like? And I said, yes, sir, we, we serve all our populations. Absolutely, we serve them all. We don't leave out the ones that, uh, that you don't like. <laughs> That's what I wanted to say. I didn't say that. But um, this elder reminded me uh, of the idea of service, the idea of inclusion, uh, and doing what's sensible. So we go to the next slide. Here in British Columbia, the First Nations um, have become equal partners in their healthcare delivery, um, in that, uh, as many of you may or may not know, the lion's share of health work um, belongs to the provinces. Um, the federal government pl um, plays a smaller role um, for First Nations people, uh, we used to be federal, we, we were considered federal subjects and thus we received special federal funding um, to, prov to receive health services and uh, often we were excluded from provincial services, the, the provincial services saying, you know, you're covered by federal services, so go somewhere else. Uh, and in the last many, many years, uh, about the last uh, 10 years or so, First Nations have been saying, uh, we want to participate in our own healthcare system and not just be passive recipients. Uh, and uh, at some of those tables, we would literally hear, we don't think you have the capacity to look after yourselves. We don't see the capacity for you to look after yourselves. And uh, that really kind of galvanized us and we said, that's ridiculous, of course we can, because uh, like most patients, we already are looking after ourselves and the services that we 
that we ask for, say kidney-related services, um, are adjuncts. We only come to them at special times in our lives. So um, looking after ourselves is um, you know, part of the patient voice. They're already accomplishing it. Sometimes they need help, and that's why we're here. So on this slide, and, and you can see um, Chief Douglas um, White III uh, talking about the health and wellness of my people depends on how well I work with each and every one of you in this room. We shouldn't be asking, uh, say, First Nations clients to look after themselves or asking an external entity to do that. We actually all do that together. We look after each other. Um, part of our job here, as those of you who are service providers, is we look after others and all others, not just a certain a certain portion. So here, the chief is acknowledging um, the role of others um, and the role of partnerships uh, and the role of teams in looking after um, his cohort and his peoples. And we'll go to the next slide. And the next slide, a shared commitment. Th these um, little symbols, I know it's hard to see on the slide, but they represent a number of formal agreements between the federal government, the provincial government, and First Nations governance to look after um, First Nations people. Mainly we want to address the inequities or the um, unequalness in health outcomes between um, First Nations people and other British Columbians. But we've signed agreements that we will do that. And uh, so when I meet with other stakeholders, let's say um, people who look after patients with issues with their kidneys, I say to them, you know, can you help Aboriginal and First Nations people they're worthy and deserving of our help. In fact, they have a right to um, have help. In fact, um, they're asking for and even demanding equality in outcomes, because equality in outcomes is, is equality. So how are we doing um, as far as equality in, um, in outcomes? The next slide uh, is really just showing that there are many structures in place around governance. Aboriginal people have, uh, oh, sorry, First Nations people have chiefs. Um, First Nations people have um, health organizations like my health organization, the First Nations um, Health Authority. Uh, we have workers on the ground uh, who are represented by various um, health worker organizations like um, the First Nations Health Directors Association, which is one of the icons here. Um, and we have accountabilities to our First Nations governance. We work for the people as opposed to, say, um, the provincial government or uh, a big boss doctor. We, we work for the people. And let's go to the next slide. And we're not without resources. In fact, um, um, First Nations have 203 communities, and those communities have infrastructures. Um, they have you know, buildings that, as well that help them with their health and well-being. Um, we have actually 164 community health facilities, places where healthcare workers um, can and do work. And those um, health structures are actually largely invisible to uh, most of the province's healthcare workers, and that's, that's unfortunate. Um, there are six provincial health authorities, and, and in fact, the First Nations Health Authority is considered the seventh health authority, though we're a slightly different structure, a slightly different animal than a regional health authority or the PHSA. Um, but we do provide service like the other health authorities. And go to the next slide. So how are we doing as far as kidney health? First Nations peoples in BC are at higher risk of kidney disease. Um, and this is true in the majority, I say, in my opinion, in the majority of um, health entities, we see a higher burden of illness. Um, part of this is related to our higher burden of illness in many other areas. So if we're um, you know, not as strong, um, we tend to get more diseases. And so we start this, um, this vicious cycle of um, vulnerability and poor health um, leading to vulnerability and poorer health uh, and down the line. So, so it's not uncommon for us to see um, the poorest, most vulnerable section of society, Aboriginal people, with the highest burden of illness, and in this case, um, kidney disease. And this kidney disease is um, very much related to other health conditions. And so um, for us, when we look at kidney health, we would say, well, let's look at the whole health of the person because certainly there's probably um, things that we can do to help with their kidney health that's actually protective of their overall health. Um, First Nations people also have a history of um, presenting late 
for whatever reason. And there are many, many barriers of health. They haven't really been um, truly confirmed by a lot of research, but we can guess using our best knowledge. We know, for instance, um, issues like um, you know, how geographically close is the service to this First Nations community or these individuals, how um, socially isolated are the Aboriginal individuals or patients, you know, do they feel like this service is a service meant for them and where they feel welcome. Um, historically, how have they done in the care of um, caregivers who are not part of their culture? Like, do they have previous experiences, colonial experiences, disrespectful experiences, um, experiences where they feel um, belittled or blamed or stigmatized for the health conditions that they have, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So th there's a whole constellation of barriers that need to be identified for the Aboriginal client um, that need to be um, yeah, identified and then uh, knocked down. And I, I personally have a list of about um, 22 um, pieces. Um, one of the largest that relate to you as caregivers is probably around cultural competence. Cultural competence or cultural safety or cultural humility is an institutional response to someone from a different culture uh, uh, whereby we serve them in a way and a manner that's recognizable to them. So, so, um, so for instance, uh, um, in Canada, where we have such a multicultural, pluralistic success story, um, physicians are meant to serve all different kinds of Canadians, not just ones from, say, um, uh, you know, a European type uh, culture. They can reach out and provide effective service, bring someone in and say, you know, I'm, I'm meant to be um, helpful to you. Let me, um, you can trust me to help you do um, the best by you. Um, we know, uh, this is the fourth bullet, that Aboriginal children are less likely to receive kidney transplants compared to white children. And we need to control for those external factors that are part of um, Aboriginal lives and see which of those are related to the caregiver. Uh, there is a possibility, we know this from looking at American studies, looking at um, African American populations and other ethnicities in the US, that um, some caregiver bias can prevent um, patients of color from receiving the standard of care every single time compared to um, uh, other Americans um, from other ethnicities. Meaning that, just to put it really bluntly, um, racism can exist within a caregiver. They um, look at a client and they say, ah, this patient won't possibly at all be able to meet um, the requirements for my care, so um, I will give them some substandard care. If, let's say, I'm going to give them a kidney, I have to decide if I'm going to give them a kidney, and I think uh, they don't look like someone who could look after a kidney, um, then we may be biased against actually giving them that. And so this, this um, uh, statistic of Aboriginal children being less likely to receive kidney transplant compared to white children really needs to be um, dissected um, so we provide care um, equally as clinicians and we eliminate clinician bias. Um, and that means having better quality data. It means having the ability to analyze that data and have the ability to quantify inequities and make recommendations. Let's go to the next slide. So. Um, the number of kidney patients with um, diabetes have remained constant over time, and this slide shows that 50% of the time, kid kidney disease patients in BC First Nations also have diabetes, which means that 50% of kidney disease patients do not have diabetes. That's quite a large burden of kidney disease that's non-diabetic in nature. And what is the meaning of that, of, what is, of this statistic? And like many statistics, it raises more questions than it answers, and it asks us for better quality research and better quality data to explain the reason um, for that. The next slide. So the First Nations Health Authority, in speaking to its constitu constituents, and we've spoken to tens of thousands of First Nations clients, we've asked them, what do you need um, for health? What do you need um, from your health system? And um, we have heard very clearly from them, almost to a person, that they wish to have a holistic approach to health, that to them health is not just physical health, that the mind, body, and spirit for them, for us, um, is very well um, known, well uh, connected, and that that's um, what we learned um, as children. And so um, our spirit and our um, mind 
and our feelings need to be well, not just with our bodies. And if we, and if we um, have, say, kidneys that are unwell, uh, surely that has repercussion with our mental and emotional um, well-being as well. And so how do we address them all? How do we address the whole person um, and not just the kidney? And th there's that old adage to all of you out there, are you treating a kidney or are you treating a human being, a child, a woman, um, a father, a grandmother, um, and so on and so forth. And next slide. So at the First Nations Health Author Authority, we're not just part of a sickness system. We don't just deal with clients when they have, say, kidney disease or sick kidneys. We want to be a part of their, um, their sense of wellness. How do we contribute to their sense of well-being? How do we con um, contribute to their whole wellness? And we would like to be a part of that. And that means us, um, as an institution, as an organization, being a wellness champion. We promote health. Uh, we champion health, we demand health, we, we, um, we talk about health constantly, and we ask the patient um, to move forward um, to maximize their potential uh, as um, one of their partners. The next slide is a reminder around cultural humility for health professionals, and I hope you can look around this graphic. It's really just a, a pictorial depiction. It's you know one picture of looking at what um, uh, cultural humility can look like for um, health professionals, and really cultural humility is the idea of self-reflection for um, workers. Um, why am I thinking and feeling um, um, what I'm thinking and feeling while I'm doing this work? The, the best example is a very simple one where a patient is unwell. Um, let's say a, a health professional like a nurse comes in, she has a job to do, she has to take vital signs, she has to check on the uh, medications that are going into the patient. Um, She's busy and she's working, and the community and or in the family can be um, thinking, "I wish that nurse would be quiet because my loved one needs um, peacefulness right now." Um, and the nurse is saying, "I need to get my job done," um, and they can be in conflict with each other. Um, and and thus we ask the professional, you know, can you at least lend a little part of yourself um, to the feelings of the family? And um, do we know you need to do your work, but can you do it quietly? And for most healthcare professionals, this idea of cultural humility, where am I working from, is very intuitive. It's very easy for them to be compassionate and empathetic. But it's not a perfect world, and sometimes um, the idea of humility in the caregiver or self-reflection, why am I doing what I'm doing, why am I feeling what I'm feeling, um, um, isn't a part of their kind of um, everyday encounter. And I think every patient um, deserves a respectful um, encounter with a healthcare professional every single time. Next slide. So the next slide is, um, is around governance. Uh, and governance is the idea of, say, um, and uh, uh, of my hundreds of meetings around governance, who's in charge of what. Uh, I always remember um, uh, we were looking at the case of a, a baby who had passed away. And uh, the family wanted the baby's body returned to them really quickly. And uh, we were meeting with a coroner who said, you know, by law, by the BC Coroner Act, I am allowed to keep this baby's body for as long as I deem reasonable, um, like, say, under two weeks, um, in order to determine the cause of death. And uh, the chief, who was there to speak for the family, said, we know you think you're in charge of this baby, but we think this is our baby. We think this is our family member. And it really illustrated to me extremely clearly um, the patient voice and the, the, the patient stakeholder that um, you know, sometimes the clinician or the law or the hospital is not the sole boss of me. That sometimes I, we, as the family member, as the dad, as the sister, um, we think we have a say in the lives of our loved ones. And so um, in governance, as First Nations people, we talk very clearly about who's in charge of what. And, uh, and I hope, by hearing from me for these last several minutes, that it's very clear to you um, that the indigenous voice and the care of indigenous people um, needs to be heard um, a little better than it um, has been in the past. Thank you very much.